You may hear this distinctive cry if you visit the Kasi and Jantia hills at a display of traditional war dances or before a challenging task to cheer on a clan or a team. In unison and with full-throated vigor, it rings out across the hills and valleys to bring together a people to face a storm as it did in 1829. India's cry for freedom from the British rule echoed from what is today's Meghalaya long before the first war of independence and a century before Bhagat Singh walked to the gallows a spark was lit from the remote northeast a spark of the fire of patriotism that would become a conflagration with Utirot Singh as the torch bearer We journey to Shillong to retell the saga of a confederacy of Khasi tribal chiefs that held the mighty British forces at bay for nearly 4 years of what the British call the Anglo-Khasi War. What do the Khasis call it? We ask Professor Helen Giri, well-known historian and cultural icon from Meghalaya. Uh, you see, in my opinion, I call it as a Khasi resistance movement against the British uh, colonial power. Where do we begin the story? So we start with 1824 with the contact between the British colonial power and the Sutunga native state. Sutunga is the name of a place in Giant Hills. To say that we can even go back to the Diwani of Bengal, 1765, With the East India Company's acquisition of the Diwani of Bengal in 1765, Silhet had come into British possession. The Brahmaputra Valley would become theirs by 1826 with the signing of the Treaty of Yandabu. Enter David Scott, agent to the Governor General for the northeast frontier of Bengal. and commissioner of Assam David Scott or Iskat Sahib as the Khasis called him required a road through the hills to join the two valleys for trade and commerce there were other reasons to secure their foothold on the hills rich limestone or coal quarries and the cool and salubrious climate being a couple of them An East India Company letter from that time talks about the Khasis as a race of barbarous and savage mountaineers whose aggression have constantly been the terror of our frontiers. The East India Company letter also mentions how those hills could become a healthful retreat for invalid Europeans, a happy abode for their children by the occupation of the hills by us. David Scott advocated the setting up of a sanatorium and containment for British troops at Cherapunji and entered into negotiations with a few Khasi native states called Himas and their rulers or CMs. Who exactly is a CM? We ask Professor Desmond Karma Plan of the Northeastern Hill University, Shillong. Theoretically the same is a ruler but he cannot by any stretch of the imagination be compared to the king okay because the same does not enjoy absolute power so uh, he is limited in many ways and although there are religious and sacerdotal associations of his uh, office but primarily he is uh, in that position to provide good governance Uh, which is being delivered in the traditional way he is assisted and also advised by a council of elders who are representatives of clans 
So together, they constitute the traditional system of governance. And what is a Dorbar? The Dorbar it means an assembly of all adult males of the Hima. And the Hima, again, can best be translated as a traditional state. So all male members of the Hima who have come into adulthood are members of the Dorbar Hima. So it's a very democratic setup. Absolutely, Ex- yes. In the fateful year of 1826, the heir apparent to the EM ship of Nongklao state was a young Tirot Singh. It was through Nongklao that David Scott's proposed road would be constructed. Tirot Singh announced that the decision would be taken at the full state Dorbar in November 1826. The Dorbar would also confirm Tirot Singh's accession to the throne. David Scott set out for Nongklao to keep his tryst with Tirot Singh, a full three days journey from Guwahati. It was the first time the Dorbaris would see white men in their midst. The English party was fascinated with the landscape of the hills. They were no less fascinated with the deliberations at the Dorbar, which went on till dusk and had to be adjourned to the next day. The record state, I was struck with astonishment at the order and decorum which characterized this debate. No shouts of exaltation or indecent attempts to put down the orator of the opposite party. I have often witnessed the debates in St. Stephen's Chapel, but those of the Kosia Parliament appeared to me to be conducted with more dignity of manner. When the debate continued till dusk, David Scott tried to cut it short, as this British report goes. As it grew dark, The debate not being closed, Mr. Scott rather grew impatient and, as had been his wont with the Garrows, ordered a dozen of bottles of rum to be sent up the hill in the hope of putting an end to it. The liquor was returned with a message saying that they would not drink spirits until they had come to a point at issue. Like David Scott, we too have a tryst to keep with the CM of Nongklao. The current CM, six generations removed from Tirot Singh, agrees to meet us at his office cum Dorbar Hall at Mairang on 7th July 2017. From Shillong, it is a 47-kilometer trip on a new road that is still under construction at places with slippery and treacherous portions. The mind wings back to another road that was built in this area at another time. A haunting song plays on the car stereo. Ferdinand Dakar, the co-producer of this feature, says, I love the song. It speaks about the purity of Kasi Hills, the greenery, the clean spring water, the falls, the ancestors. Oh, beloved motherland, the Ri Uhnyo Trap Nyoskum, we love you so much. The forefathers have warned that if we do not protect 
one day nobody will give a damn about our motherland is this perhaps what tirod singh felt about the motherland he cherished and wished to protect at the sleepy little town called mairang we meet the current cm prestar manik cm for those who do not know about u tirod singh what would you say who is tirod singh we might say that he is also a freedom fighter the war of independence of india start in 1837 but actually the war of independence of india start from tirod singh's time in 1829 We go back to 1826 and the Dorbar where on day 2 after a resolution a treaty was concluded with the British and the Cossiers as the British then called them agreed to help in the construction of the road that would run through their territory Professor Amina Pasa of the Department of History Northeastern Hill University takes up the story from here as the years passed tirot singh would have got these misgivings against them because of certain things happening in his hema first of all he learned about the ill treatment of the lower rank soldiers against his own people who were laborers in the construction of the road he knew about the people's uh, misgivings about the establishment of a sanatoria at uh, charapanji all of these and other factors escalated into what the british historians term the nonclaw massacre to shed light on it we have distinguished scholar from meghalaya professor david r emle 4th april 1829 in the early morning of that day beddingfield burton and some others were in the convalescent or the sanatoria built by the british in 1828 in nonclaw The permission was given by the aim of Nanklao to build the sanatoria uh, to David Scott. But David Scott also very carefully and craftfully, may I say, also extracted an undertaking by the aim for the construction of a road. So the sanatoria was developing, the road was developing. There was some very unpleasant incidents between the Khasi ladies and the men who were constructing that road. But more than that, the khasis must have felt that after the annexation of assam after silhet was incorporated into the empire in 1765 that their turn would be coming the very sad part about our narrative on tirod singh is much of the narrative is british records we call out from the british records we we call it wanton massacre but we don't take the khasi perspective of it the khasi perspective was freedom keeping the british out and there's a perspective growing back in our hills of looking at the khasi perspective of how all this happened all this flared up in the incident of 4th april 1829 it was reported that tirod singh was prominently concerned in the massacre of two british officers and about 60 native british subjects color sergeant born Oh my god. Station on the roof. Bring your rifles about on the hillside. Fire at the smoke. Fire! The Khasi resistance was to be a long drawn out one, says Dr. David Arts Emle, eminent historian. They had only spears, they had some muskets, but the muskets would have been ineffective in the hills. it was all by guerrilla tactics and uh, it showed that even if they were small in number the resistance went on from um, april of 1829 right till the january of 1833 and believe me it didn't stop with tirod singh's uh, surrender it continued well after that well well after that yes dr amina pasa adds by the end of 1832 Tirod Singh had met the British and he said that uh, you have to stop the construction 
but the British refused. And Dirat Singh carried on this fight. You can just imagine they were fighting with bows and arrows and spears against the might of the British Empire. But because they knew that their, the country was at stake, the British observed that very soon, even those chiefs and villages who were supposed to be on friendly terms with the English, they were surreptitiously aiding, abetting Tirot Singh, either with shelter or with weapons or with food. <laughs> Tirot Singh was the key role in holding the Confederacy together. Though he was ably supported by others like Bormanik, Manput and others, he matched the British intrigues with his well-trained spies. He strategized and inspired. He scouted the countryside and built secret hideouts and escape routes. The war cries rang out louder and moved from mountain to mountain. Even women came out and joined the movement, says Dr. Amina Pasa of the History Department at Northeastern Hill University. He was able to get the support of this very uh, dynamic young woman, okay, Pan Nong Lai. She played a very important role and she even put her life and integrity on the line because she became friends with the British soldiers to solicit information to pass on to Tirat Singh. It was not easy for Pan Nong Lai to act as an informer. You know, she may be killed, she may be tortured. But I think she was so inspired by the dynamism of Tirat Singh. History has recorded the story of the great Khasi chief surrender in 1833. By that act, he stopped the torture and embargoes heaped upon his people by the British and extracted many concessions for his people through protracted negotiations. After a trial, he was deported to Dhaka and till as recently as 1986, it was believed that he died shortly after in Dhaka jail at an uncertain date, unsung and alone. Says David R. Siemle, historian and chairman, Union Public Service Commission. The sad part about this whole story of Tirat Singh is that we still believe he died in prison, that he died a common prisoner. I went to the Dhaka records, the jail records, and I found each prisoner was getting rupees one per day. I did not find Tirat Singh's name. So he was not in the common jail. I've also found that he had a house in Dhaka. He had servants in Dhaka. He was given an allowance in Dhaka. In fact, let us appreciate the British in some sense that they gave a Khasi chief that dignity of living as a Khasi chief in Dhaka. Dr. David R. Siemle had a tryst to keep with Tirot Singh to ascertain the date of his demise. I was in Calcutta in 1986 following my research after I submitted my PhD and I found a document in the Friend of India 1835, which talks about Tirat Singh living in a house in Dhaka, moving around in a palki, getting an allowance under the watchful eye of the British authorities, which meant that in 1835, he was alive. Two years later, I was in London doing research for a book and I asked for a document relating to Dhaka 1835, Bengal proceedings. And looking through that proceedings, I was able to get the correspondence informing the death of Tirat Singh. The letters dated 18th July. I have the honor to report for the information of the government the demise of the ex Raja Tirat Singh, a state prisoner under my charge which event took place yesterday at 1 p.m. 
Returning back to Shillong, I wrote an article of it in the Nehu Journal, and there was a large number of people who were there appreciating it. And eventually, and I'm very happy that the government of Meghalaya has declared 17th of July a state holiday. Seventeenth July was only ten days away when we had visited the sleepy town of Mairang. Bamboo scaffolding was going up in a field close to the office and doorbar of the CM. Preparations for the annual functions, we are told. Next to the field stands the memorial to Tirot Singh, unveiled in 1954. Ferdinand Dakar reads out the inscription on stone. To the sacred memory of Hutirot Singh, this aim of Nongklao state, who gave his life to protect his countrymen. This is my own, my native land, the land consecrated with blood of my ancestors. Today, it is quiet and peaceful around the memorial. Bird song has long replaced the bark of weapons, and the wind can read and ponder the words on the memorial. He died young, after a long and exhausting war, far away from the hills he loved. From the people he fought for, a free spirit broken by confinement. Is his spirit kept alive in the hills he called home, or was his sacrifice in vain? We asked the current CM of Nong Klao, Presta Manik CM. Present generation, no? most of them did not follow his examples. So I feel that his uh, sacrifice, no? As a pair that <laughs> what the Tirat Singh has uh, left behind, no? his uh, example, most of us are saying we did not follow. Back in Shillong that evening, we meet Samuel Jirwa, who thinks differently. I feel that even though Tirat Singh might have lost the war against the mighty British Empire, but his war against the British Empire make the people realize that to preserve culture and identity is very important. And even after the onslaught of the British rule in India, uh, also in Khas Hills, for more than 100 years, we still maintain our identity, our culture. So I don't know, without the struggle of Thirat Singh, what we would have been today. Samuel Jirva is the former president Kasi Students Union and currently Chairman Northeast Students Organization. Kasi history is fragmentary at best. How does one piece together the story of a man and his times? We ask Dr. Desmond Karmal Plan, eminent folklorist. Khasi oral history is largely sustained through a genre of folklore we know as Kanapateng. So what you see happening here is that there is a flow of continuity and consistency. All the narratives that center, you know, around this great personality, Thirat Singh, have diffused into you know, the oral tradition and uh, they have uh, been sustained in, in different genres and subgenres. There are folk songs that talk about the personality of Thirat Singh. There are also indications through songs that talks about his fluency in the language of our neighbors in Assamese because he had a tutor who lived in his household and this tutor was an Assamese man. And then you also have 
tales uh, which are being spun, you know, have uh, generated these uh, legendary accounts. We come across uh, very sophisticated uh, plays that have been written about the life of Tiran Singh, you know, his encounter with the colonial uh, aggressors and so on. So this is how the collective memory that the people have of Tiran Singh is being uh, sustained. Many a power has been inspired by the valor of Tirot Singh. The powers are poetic creations indigenous to the Khasis, spontaneous, witty, a sort of verbal duel. Sawal Jawab. The Khasis are the Mao Haki comes to the Basno Trim. How what they say in Bakra, Uta de Utirot Singh's aim. Oh, yeah! Many songs were composed on the heroic saga of Tirot Singh, says Dr. Helen Giri, a Padma Shri recipient and member, Sangeet Natak Academy. Some have been published, some have been sung only through the on the radio, through stages in the different areas, right from the rural areas to the urban areas, the rural composers and the urban composers. They will never lose sight of the deeds of Tirot Singh Bormanik's aim, Kyang Nongba, and so on and so forth. Even Pan Nong Lai. She, I think, she should be recorded well. And I've seen there is a place, a very big river that's in that part of Nong Klao, where you will still find like a circle in the river. And you will find that it was there that she threw all the bayonets of the British. I think yeah, there are so many historians who have written about Kapanong Lai and so many songs which have been composed about her. There is still, now you'll still find a whirling, it's, it's whirling. It's like a whirlpool? Oh yeah, something like that. Dirat Singh, Dirat Singh, the Dirat Singh, the man, is still shrouded in mystery for us. He was a man with strong physique despite one of his arms being uh, slightly disabled. He, he never married. There are indications perhaps that he did father a child, uh, whether in the Khasi Hills or whether in Dhaka. We don't know the details of it. But what is fascinating about the man is that the story continues to be narrated in every hamlet in the Khasi Hills. It draws inspiration from people. And if we have to look at Tirat Singh, we have to compare him for what he was per se and not make too much comparisons with anybody else. But even if we look at Tirat Singh as an individual, yes, he was amongst the earliest of the freedom fighters in the Northeast. The saga of Tirat Singh is still evolving. Dr. David R. Siemle feels If you happen to visit Meghalaya, you may think of keeping your tryst with Tirot Singh. You may go trekking on the David Scott Trail or go caving in the very same caves in Nongklao where Tirot Singh and his men hid or admire the milky white cascades of the Pan Nong Lai Falls named after the bold and beautiful warrior Pan Nong Lai. You may discover yet another piece of the story of the Rod Singh.